The graphical solution is really what's covered in the textbook and I'm going to go through it and you'll see that in the end we get the same answer but we arrive at it in a different way. So before we do anything we have to make a few assumptions on utility. And really the reason for this is that it's going to help us determine the shapes of curves and how they move in response to other variables. Okay, if we didn't have these assumptions it wouldn't be clear how to draw these different curves. And so we'll go through the assumptions and then we'll talk about how they affect sort of the shapes of curves that we see. So first of all, assumption number one seems pretty standard, which is consumers prefer more to less. Okay, so I like consumption, I like leisure, and I always prefer bundles that have more of them to bundles that have fewer. Seems to make sense, right? Assumption number two, consumers prefer variety. And really, this is just a function of diminishing marginal utility. So when I say prefer variety, it means I would prefer to have some of everything, so some consumption and some leisure, rather than a lot of a single good. Okay, and I claim here that this is a function of diminishing marginal utility. So why? Well, imagine the bundle I have here. So this bundle is, uh, I consume 100 units and I consume no leisure at all. Well, because of diminishing marginal utility, what does this mean? It means, first of all, that the marginal utility of consumption is very low. I have a lot of consumption right now already, 100 units. And so additional units, either gaining or losing an additional unit of consumption, will yield very little utility. Or put another way, if I give up a small amount of consumption, if I give up one unit of consumption, I'm not going to lose very much utility. On the other hand, the marginal utility of leisure is very high. I don't have any. And so an additional unit of leisure will yield me a lot of utility. And so kind of obviously what I'm going to want to do is to trade some consumption for leisure along the budget constraint. So I'm going to give up some consumption by working less to consume more leisure. And so this is really just a function of this diminishing marginal utility that in general, I'm not going to want a case like this. Instead, I'm going to want a case where I have kind of a mix of the two. Assumption three, consumption and leisure are both normal goods. So <coughs> this is about, <coughs> sorry. This is about what happens when income increases. It says, when my income increases, I want more leisure and more consumption. And the reason is because they're both normal goods. So a normal good is just a good that I consume more of as my income increases. And I say here that's not necessarily true for all goods. So we're making that assumption for these two, but you can think about cases where it might not be true, right? So for example, some goods are what's called inferior which is the opposite. It means as my income increases, I consume less of them. And so here I put one example, which is discount brand paper towel. You can imagine that if I have a very low income and I consume paper towel at all, I probably buy discount brand paper towel. It's not worth it to me to buy the expensive stuff. But as my income increases, say I'm a millionaire, there's no reason why I wouldn't buy the premium, you know, soft, whatever, select a size, I mean, uh, I have the income, I might as well. And so I switch, I don't buy the discount paper brand, the discount brand paper towel, and instead I buy the sort of expensive one. And so because as my income increased, I buy less of the discount brand, it's an inferior good. Now, just let me reiterate, in this case, we're assuming both consumption and leisure are normal goods, they are not inferior. So for the graphical presentation, now we have to introduce another concept here, and that's going to be indifference curves. And the definition is as follows, that bundles of consumption and leisure that yield the same utility are on the same indifference curve. So these curves are going to represent consumption bundles of C and L, consumption and leisure, that yield identical levels of utility. Okay. So we're going to put them in the LC space like this. 
And I claim, and I'll show you why in a second, that they're going to look something like this. This is the indifference curve which yields utility U1, which means that any two points on it, so let's just pick two points here, so we'll call this one, this is C1 L1, and this is C2 L2. Any two points on this indifference curve yield the same amount of utility, or put another way, U of C1 L1 is equal to U of C2 L2, which are both equal to U1. So that's the concept of an indifference curve. Any point on this curve yields the same utility. Any bundle along this curve yields me the same utility. So put another way, I'm indifferent between those two consumption bundles that we picked. So now let's talk about the shape. <coughs> so first of all, why do indifference curves slope down? Well, the answer just comes from the fact that more is preferred to less. So <clears throat> let me just write here what I mean. So if, for example, leisure increases, so I start from some bundle and I increase leisure, then for the, consum for the consumer to be indifferent, this means that C must fall. I must consume less. Okay, so starting from some arbitrary bundle, if I take that bundle and I increase leisure, if I don't decrease C as well, then I'll no longer be indifferent. So to make me indifferent between those two bundles, oh, I can even draw a little diagram here. So here's the first bundle, here's the second bundle. So going from one to the other, I increase leisure. To make me indifferent between the two, the only way you can make me indifferent is by decreasing C. And the reason that holds is that I like both goods, right? So more is always preferred to less. So in other words, because L is increasing, giving me more utility, to compensate, you have to give me less C. Now the sort of other side to this, so I'll just put a little aside here. I'll do it in, I don't know what color, let's do it in red. An aside is you can imagine, what if I didn't like one of the goods? And this kind of proves my point, that the reason they slope down is because I like both goods. So imagine instead the two goods were pizza and cockroaches. Okay, so I like pizza, of course, but I don't like cockroaches. Well then what would the indifference curve look like? Now it would be upward sloping. Is this how you spell it? Cockroaches. There we go. There's no K in it. <clears throat> so it would be upward sloping now. Why is that? Because now this says as you increase the number of cockroaches I consume, which I don't like, the only way you can compensate me to make me indifferent between these two bundles is by also increasing the thing I do like, which is pizza. So all this is to say is that because we like both goods, because more is preferred to less, the indifference curve slope downwards. If this was not the case, we would get the opposite. So if I didn't like one of them, we would have upward sloping indifference curves. Okay, next question. Why are indifference curves bowed towards the origin? or convex. So what I mean by this is, why is it when we draw them, the slope decreases as we increase leisure? So why do they curve in towards the origin like that? And as I said, another way of saying this is that these indifference curves are convex. And the reason is because of decreasing marginal utility, or what we said is the same thing, preference for variety. So to show you why this is, let's just pick an arbitrary point here. So this is a point at which I have very little leisure and a lot of consumption. And now the question is, we're talking about why the slope decreases, right? That's what makes it bowed in towards the origin is that as L increases, the slope of our indifference curve is falling. Or that is, since it's a negative slope, I should say the absolute value of the slope is falling. 
the magnitude of the slope is falling. So why is that? Well, <clears throat> imagine I increase L by a little bit at this point. Okay, so I increase it to here, to L2. <clears throat> then my claim is that to stay on the same indifference curve, I have to give up a lot of consumption. So this is the slope, right? Is how much consumption do I have to give up to remain indifferent when I increase leisure by a little bit? And I'm saying that when L is small, you have to give up a lot. And the reason is because I have very little leisure. So this small increase in leisure produces a lot of additional utility, right? Because I have a small amount, this small increase, this small increase produces a large increase in utility. And so to be indifferent, I have to give up a lot of consumption. Okay, so I'm just gonna write this quickly. I have little leisure. So, uh, a small increase in L produces a large increase in utility. And so therefore, to compensate, to stay indifferent, I need to lose a lot of consumption. Okay, what about the opposite case? So let's draw this one more time. What if I have a lot of L? What if I have a lot of leisure? Well, in that case, the opposite holds, right? So here's my indifference curve one more time. Now let's say we're starting at this point. Okay, so I'll call this L3. Now I have a lot of leisure. So when I increase leisure by a bit, I don't actually gain that much additional utility. And this is because of diminishing or decreasing marginal utility. And so to stay indifferent, that means that actually I don't have to give up very much consumption. And so that's why the slope is falling. You'll notice here the slope is much smaller than it was above when we drew that initial point. So now, because I have a lot, a lot of leisure, a small increase produces little utility. And therefore, I need to lose very little consumption to stay indifferent. Okay, so that's why indifference curves are convex. Now, there's one other way of seeing this, and this is going to be important for our analytical, uh, our analytical examination of this question. And that's gonna be, we can actually derive the slope analytically of this indifference curve, okay? And we can derive it mathematically and I'll show you very quickly how to do that. So remember that any point on an indifference curve is defined by the utility of the bundle C and L is equal to some fixed utility. So we'll call it U bar. So that means that any changes in C and L along the indifference curve can't change that utility. So put another way, if you totally differentiate this utility function with respect to both of its arguments, it should yield zero. So this is what I mean by total differentiate. I mean the derivative with respect to C times a small change in C plus the derivative with respect to leisure times a small change in leisure has to give me zero along the indifference curve. So now we can rearrange this for the slope of the indifference curve. So just moving uh, <coughs> the DC, this part here, to the other side, and then making the appropriate divisions, what we get is the following. 
is equal to du dl over du dc. And remember that these two terms are just marginal utilities. So this is the marginal utility of leisure over the marginal utility of consumption, which is what we call the marginal rate of substitution between consumption and leisure. And this is also equal to the slope of the indifference curve. So this is, whoops, sorry, this, I don't know why I'm losing that. This is the marginal rate of substitution. And it's equal to the slope of the indifference curve. And you'll notice that as L increases, so as leisure increases, this MRS, the marginal rate of substitution, falls. Why is that? Well, because as L increases, this numerator, MUL, falls, right, because of diminishing marginal utility. And at the same time, we're decreasing the amount of consumption. And so this term, the denominator, increases. And so that causes the entire thing to fall. And so that's just another way of seeing why these indifference curves slope or bow towards the origin. It's because the marginal rate of substitution is falling in leisure. And the marginal rate of substitution is just the slope of the indifference curve. One more piece here. Higher indifference curves have higher utility, okay? And so what do I mean by this? When I say higher indifference curves, I mean indifference curves that are to the right and above other ones. So here's my u1. If I had another indifference curve here, u2, I claim that this one must have the property that u2 greater than u1. So it represents a higher level of utility than the other one. And the answer is simply because more is preferred to less, right? I mean, this one's maybe a little bit more obvious. Take any point, sorry, take any point on this indifference curve and consider the following. So let's first consider I keep the level of consumption the same and I increase leisure. Well, this new point is obviously going to have higher utility because more is preferred to less. I haven't lost any consumption, but I've gained leisure. So therefore, that point must have higher utility. Likewise, moving upwards means I'm gaining consumption without using any utility because I'm not losing any leisure. And so that point also must offer higher utility. So any movements in this direction, either up or to the right, necessarily give me more utility. Okay, so this says points to the right or up necessarily offer more utility. And therefore, they must be preferred. Okay, great. So now that we have these pieces, let's put this together to make the graphical solution to the consumer's problem. So first, <clears throat> we can rephrase it in the following way, the consumer's problem. Remember that what they want to do is maximize their utility subject to their budget constraint. But what that really means is consider any feasible bundle, any affordable bundle given my budget constraint, then pick the bundle, the point in that space that is on the highest indifference curve. That's how we can rephrase the problem. But then this says, or this leads us to ask, okay, well, which bundles are feasible or affordable? And as I said, it's those bundles which uh, fulfill our budget constraint. So recall that our budget constraint is the following. It's the consumption 
has to be equal to our total income minus taxes. And we can graph this in that same space that we had our indifference curves. It'll look like the following. Okay. So this is the same space as our indifference curves. So the way we think about this is, okay, first imagine that I'm working all possible hours, or sorry, the opposite. Imagine that I'm working no hours. So therefore, leisure is equal to total hours. Okay, so that's this part here. So that would mean that this part will be equal to zero. Okay. Then how much consumption can I have? Well, it's the remaining part, this pi minus t. So when leisure is equal to h, my total consumption is equal to my non-wage income. So that's profits minus taxes. And this makes sense, right? If I'm not working, I'm only consuming leisure, then the only income I can have is any profit income minus any taxes that I have to pay. <clears throat> okay, so that's that point. Now let's consider what happens as we decrease the amount of leisure that we're taking. Well, as we decrease the amount of leisure we're taking, for each hour of leisure we lose, and therefore each hour of work we gain, each additional hour we're working, we can consume W units more of consumption, right? Because I work that hour, I earn the wage of W, and I consume that much consumption, W units. And so that means we can draw a line which will have the slope of W for the wage. <clears throat> Two things to note. First, I'm assuming here, and will continue to assume, that this, so pi minus t, or my non-wage income, profits minus taxes, is greater than zero. This isn't necessarily the case, but in general we'll assume this. Okay, so in general we're going to assume this is greater than zero. Next, so given this that we've drawn, our budget constraint, what does this mean for feasible points? Well, anything shaded in blue here is a feasible bundle. It's a bundle that doesn't, or that I can afford. It's a bundle that doesn't exhaust my, my budget constraint. But importantly, since we like both leisure and consumption, we won't pick a point in the interior, like point A here. And the reason is because, because we like both goods, obviously I'm better off either increasing my consumption or increasing my leisure or both from point A. And so this means that the only points we'll pick would be ones on the boundary or ones that satisfy our budget constraint exactly. So we might pick a point here, or here, or here, or here, and so on. Okay. Now the next thing we said is, given the points that are feasible, now pick the indifference curve that is the highest possible indifference curve, given the feasible points. And now I claim that this is the same as saying, pick the indifference curve, which is tangent to the budget constraint. Okay, so let's draw our budget constraint one more time here. Well, I shouldn't say one more time. We'll be drawing it maybe quite a bit in this course. But let's draw it again. <clears throat> now imagine you have some indifference curves. So here's one indifference curve. I'll do them in a different color. I'll do them in blue. So here's one indifference curve. Okay, so as we said, we're not going to pick any points on the interior here. Okay, so I claim there's a higher indifference curve that I could pick. So let's keep going. We could make a higher indifference curve and so on. And the highest indifference curve will be the one that is just tangent to the budget line. That will be the highest indifference curve. 
it's the one that just touches the budget line and therefore is just tangent to it. <clears throat> and this point of tangency, what does that mean? Well, that means the following. It means that the slope of the indifference curve, okay, because so I'll put it here, tangency means slope of indifference curve is equal to the slope of the budget line, okay? And we know what those are. We know what those slopes are. So the slope of the indifference curve is just the marginal rate of substitution. We worked this out already. And we also worked out that the slope of the budget line is W, the wage, right? And also remember that we know the equation of this marginal rate of substitution. It's MUL over MUC. And finally, <clears throat> I suppose I have room on the next slide here. As it turns out, I claim this turns out to be the exact same solution of what we had before. Okay, so I'll write this one more time. If we rearrange this, we get the exact same solution we got from the analytical solution, right? Which says that the marginal utility of leisure has to be equal to the wage times the marginal utility of consumption. And one more time, the reason for this is if they weren't equal, say that, this time I'll do it the other way, say that the inequality went this way, this would mean that I can take one less hour of leisure, lose a little bit of utility, and gain more utility than I lose by working one more hour, earning wage W, and consuming that amount. 